Okay, so we're looking at uh, types of precipitation here. So we have three basic types of precipitation. Um, convectional precipitation is really easy, as is orographic, and then cyclonic is a bit of a confusing thing, but it's, it's not overly hard then as well. Uh, so we just got a bit of a cheesy reading on the front, quick little description for each one. And then on the back, I thought we could do a bit of a, a quick little sketch here. All right, so our first thing here is uh, air does four things, right? So we got a bit of a reminder here across the top. So what are those uh, four magical things that air constantly does that drives overall precipitation in an area? So if I give you the first one, maybe you can finish it. So air... rises, and then when air rises... it cools, condenses, and falls. Cools... Condenses and falls. So air rises, cools, condenses, and falls. Okay, so when you read through the quick description of uh, convectional precipitation at the front, it's actually really easy. So uh, after you've read through it, we get a bit of a cheesy sketch here. So there's my lovely picture of the sun. Okay, so we have this shortwave radiation coming from the sun. And... There's our ground. So when the shortwave radiation heats up the ground, the ground is going to release the ground's going to release water vapor in the form of evaporation. Okay, and that evaporation is going to rise where it's going to cool, and it's ultimately going to condense at what's known as the dew point. So the dew point is the point in the sky, or it doesn't really have to be the sky, where you get water vapor transforming into water droplets. So once you hit the dew point, you'll eventually form clouds. And when you get convectional precipitation, oftentimes it's, it's caused by heating of the ground, right? So oftentimes you get violent rising of air. And when you get violent rising of air or um, you know, a ton of air rising. These are your typical kind of afternoon thunderstorms um, in the middle of summer type thing. And so when you get those, you get scary lightning and a torrential short-lived downpour. So convectional precipitation, sun heats ground, ground releases water vapor. That water vapor rises where it cools and condenses at the dew point forms these big, tall, dark, and scary clouds. When you get tall, dark, and scary clouds, you get a violent uprising of air, which leads to torrential downpours and a change in overall electric charge, which, uh, which causes lightning as well. Afternoon thunderstorms, you go outside at 2 o'clock. It is beautiful outside by 4 o'clock. Holy cow, the sky is black. And you get poured on for a couple of hours, and then it should be somewhat back to normal. If it's not back to normal, the same pattern will probably happen tomorrow. Okay, so then we move on to orographic precipitation. So orographic precipitation is all about relief, and it's all about relief causing um, an, a forcing of that air to rise, basically. So once you read through the little bit of a blurb on the front, we'll flip to the back here and we'll sketch out a bit of a quick picture. Okay, so orographic precipitation is typically in uh, coastal, it doesn't have to be in coastal regions, but it's most effective, I guess, in coastal mountainous regions. So let's pretend we have um, a coastal mountain range, let's say. Now that surface of the water should be somewhat level, but that's okay. We'll go with it. And uh, we'll draw a shark for good measure. Okay, so let's say the predominant wind pattern is blowing that way. When that predominant wind hits the mountain, it's ultimately going to be forced to... It's going to be forced to rise. When you're forced to rise, you're forced to cool. When you're forced to cool, you must condense. When you condense, your droplets will get larger, heavier, unable to sustain themselves in the sky, and fall. Cool. So the air rises. Ultimately, it hits a certain point in the mountain. Right? It hits the dew point of the mountain. The dew point is where water vapor turns to water droplets at the dew point. So above the dew point you get clouds, 
not necessarily the tall, dark, and scariest, but um, just just typical sheet clouds, let's say, covering the sky, right? Ultimately, that cloud will grow higher and higher up into the sky. When you get higher and higher up into the sky, you become less able to hold onto the water vapor and ultimately cause rain. So this is the side of the mountain that the wind strikes, so we're going to call that the windward side. Okay, so simple, air hits mountain, forced to rise, forced to cool, forced to condense the dew point, and falls on the windward side of the mountain. Now on the way back down, let's take a thought here for a sec. As the air goes over the peak of the mountain, it goes to the other side where it's ultimately forced to go down. When it's forced to go down, instead of cooling, it warms up. Okay, so it warms up on the way down the mountain. And this is known as the leeward side. So for air to, uh, sorry, for water vapor within air to cool, condense, and fall, it has to first cool in order to condense in order to fall. So as it's descending, it's doing the opposite of cooling. So any moisture that's in the, um, any moisture that's in the air mass itself is going to get held onto by that air mass and you end up with a very dry side of the mountain. So all right, warms here. And you end up with a very dry side of the mountain on the leeward side. And you also get then uh, what's known as a rain shadow. Just another name for it. So rain shadow is the dry uh, leeward side of a mountain. Rises, hits the dew point, cools, forms clouds, precipitates on the windward side, goes down and warms up on the uh, leeward side of a mountain. Okay, so the first two are fairly simple. The third one, sorry for the bleed through of the marker. The third one is a bit of a longer story. And so basically we're all talking about collisions of air masses. So air masses contain different characteristics, right? And so those different characteristics could be, try and think of a few. So the different characteristics of those air masses could be uh, temperature, pressure, uh, wind speed and direction. Um, what else have we got? Humidity and uh, possible precipitation, let's say. But those are your, precipitation is more of a result, but those are your major characteristics, let's say. Pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, and possibly precipitation. Major differences between air mass number one and air mass number two. So what this story is gonna give you here is that when a warm air mass runs into a cold air mass, something happens. And when a cold air mass chases down a warm air mass, something else happens. So we'll get to a little bit more of a detailed description of this tomorrow. But basically, I think you have two cheesy little drawings. And so drawing number one, all I'm drawing is, let's pretend that's an air mass number one, and this is an air mass number two, and there's our ground. For this, We'll pretend the wind is blowing that way. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw it for the other one as well. And again, these are incredibly not detailed, they're undetailed. And uh, we will add to this tomorrow. It's, uh, it's okay. Bit of a building thing here. Okay, so we got two drawings here. We'll pretend this is one set of cyclonic precipitation and this is another wind air mass pushing these air masses this way and pushing these air masses this way. Okay, we'll go with it. So let's pretend we get a cold air mass chasing down a warm air mass and then let's go the other way and we have a warm air mass running into a cold air mass. So um, cold air typically tends to move faster because warm air would be more likely to hold water and make it stickier and slower and just slower moving overall. I always picture uh, if you're a track star which outfit are you going to run faster in? A bone dry outfit or a soaking wet outfit? Probably the bone dry outfit, right? Um, so for this, you get a cold air mass running into a warm air mass and that cold air mass is going to force that warm air mass up rapidly and so it's going to form your tall, dark and scary clouds, right? A whole bunch of them maybe and you get your torrential downpours, your lightning and all the rest. Basically what happens when air masses run into one another, uh, they run into one another and those differences in characteristics get mitigated or they get evened out by 
precipitation. So when cold runs into warm, you get a fairly violent and short storm where you go from this air mass to this air mass relatively quickly. Uh, you're always kind of pretending that you're standing, let's say right here, this whole system is blowing across over the top of you. So this cold front, the front of the cold air mass, causes a certain type of precipitation, which is violent, um, fairly brief, and has an overall change in characteristics. So the characteristics of a warm air mass would be warmer air, you know, lower pressure, possibly more humidity, overcast sky, and you'll go th from that condition through a violent storm and end up in a cold air mass which would have lower temperatures, higher pressures, clear sky, and unlikely precipitation. Cold beats up warm, relatively brief storm. Hey, that rhymed. Okay, so now we go to the other side here. And so let's pretend we have a cold air mass just kind of hanging out. So again, a review of our cold air mass characteristics would be uh, low temperatures, warmer, uh, sorry, low temperatures, higher pressures, clear skies, lack of precipitation. And we have a warm air mass, let's say, blowing up from the Gulf of Mexico or, or coming across the Midwest United States, and it's going to hit us, bringing in what's called a warm front, the front of the warm air mass passing over us. So while a cold front is an intense storm, a warm front isn't. And what happens is this cold, dense air hangs out and is in our general region for a while as this warm air slowly but surely runs into it. And as it runs into it, it's forced to rise because it's the warmer air. Warmer air is more volatile, more likely to rise. So slowly but surely, this warm air mass is going to rise up over top of the cold air mass and it's just basically going to cover the sky in these sheet-like clouds. It's almost like the whole sky was covered in a blanket, a gray blanket or something. They're called stratus clouds as opposed to cumulus clouds, but we'll get to that uh, tomorrow then as well. So we get these big sheet sky covering clouds, let's say, and um, basically uh, they're not more likely to rain because they don't have the violent rising nature. They just kind of get forced their way up. So here's where you might get some rain throughout the course of a few days as a warm front is passing through and ultimately then once this whole warm front goes through you have now transitioned again you're standing here and this whole storm blows over you you've transitioned from this air mass to this air mass you've gone from a cold air mass which is uh, low temperatures high pressures clear sky to a warm air mass which is warmer temperatures lower pressure possible rain uh, muggier conditions that type of thing so two different things can happen in cyclonic precipitation when you have a, a cold front advancing on a warm air mass or a warm front advancing on a cold air mass. Three different types of precipitation, really, really simple, um, not really very complicated at all, and then slightly more complicated, and we'll add to these two then tomorrow as well. Okay.